Thank you, Marcy, and welcome everyone. We're glad you're here and joining us again today for this webinar. Um, I'm going to jump through these first couple of slides, and uh, you've seen the description for the program when you signed up, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Let me talk briefly about the learning objectives, um, because that'll shape a little bit of what we'll be discussing today. Um, we'll talk about conditions necessary for wood destroying organisms like uh, decay, uh, mold, and, and termites. Uh, we'll talk about some construction techniques that uh, prevent moisture intrusion and clearances, drainage, uh, moisture barriers, that type of thing. Uh, we'll talk about some remedies for improper design and just uh, hopefully provide you a little more information and knowledge about preservative treated uh, wood, naturally durable species, grading issues, uh, that type of thing. So um, as we always do, we want to get a sense of who's in our audience today. So I'll ask Marcy to come back and lead our first poll. Absolutely. Go ahead and um, vote within the poll box, um, whether you're an architect, engineer, code official, builder, or other. So, and as usual, I wait until I have about 80% or about 30 to 40 seconds. And it's, and typically, you know, we have about the same fallout as far as um, how many we have, um, mostly engineers and then code officials. Um, and let me close here and then show you show you our percentage um, welcome we've got 72 percent engineers 16 percent code officials six percent architects and six percent other no builders so and this is typically I think that's pretty much what we standardly have so welcome everybody great thanks Marcy and um, again welcome everyone what you're looking at now on the screen is uh, a new um, web page uh, or a map from a web page that we've put together for our website. And the reason for showing that here is that uh, across the country there are state and local uh, variations with respect to the model building codes. And this is especially important when we're talking about this subject of permanence or durability uh, because there are, in a lot of cases, local practices, um, some parts of the country more arid than others, um, not having the same moisture uh, problems or issues that might be in other parts of the country. And so this really does... Um, this topic in particular lend itself to um, the state and local variations, the being in touch with your code officials, um, and uh, ensuring that um, there's a good understanding of what's expected or required in those local jurisdictions. So this map um, gives a sense, and it's different from the ICC code adoption maps in that it uh, not only shares where there are statewide adoptions of certain uh, codes, but any uh, local adoptions and then limited adoptions. And when you, if you were to go to this map and click on it, it'll uh, give a few more details for you of some of the specific variations um, that are uh, specific to wood products. And so uh, we're trying to build that uh, database and provide that type of information for designers and code officials too um, with some of those local variations. So uh, that's a resource available to you. Um, as we talk about conditions that um, affect uh, durability, uh, when trees are alive and growing, uh, moisture and air are pretty important, right? And so um, to to, to get a tree, to keep a tree growing for 3,000 years like this giant sequoia, it needs moisture and air. But on the next slide, uh, the, the, the same conditions are also what 
um, help wood destroying organisms uh, to thrive as well. So moisture, um, oxygen, uh, warm temperature, and then the food source ends up being the uh, wood products. And so when we talk about trying to control those wood destroying organisms, it's uh, not always almost is or almost impossible to control the temperature um, and the oxygen so moisture control really does become uh, sort of the primary method uh, the food source is uh, can be controlled by uh, by using preservative treatments that poison the wood introduce biocides that will keep those organisms from growing as well. So the first one and last one are primarily how we are going to control um, wood destroying organisms. And we know uh, that if we do that effectively, and here's an example for you of a stave church in Norway. You've probably seen this in other presentations. Um, this church, which is nearly a thousand years old, is still functioning because of the principles that we'll be talking about in the, uh, the next hour for um, moisture control and maintenance. And so we know that, that these buildings can survive and wood products can uh, survive um, if uh, detailed and, and maintained appropriately. So the next uh, couple of slides then are some examples of structures here uh, in the U.S. The Glacier Hotel in Montana, built in 1915, still a working uh, unit, a working structure. Uh, the Butler Brothers Building in Minneapolis, built the turn of uh, right at right at the turn of the century, 1906. Um, I believe an eight or ten story uh, wood structure again maintained and still functioning today. So we know these buildings uh, and that these wood products, uh, if properly uh, detailed and, and maintained, uh, can last hundreds if not a thousand years. But that brings us to some of the topics that we'll be talking about today, which uh, come in some uh, respects from a document that we've had available for several decades. It's called the Design of Design of Wood Frame Structures for Permanence. It's part of our Wood Construction Data Series. Uh, it's w, we abbreviate WCD number six. So uh, Brian will be uh, posting the link uh, to that uh, for you uh, in the chat box. But um, it discusses uh, some of the topics we're going to be discussing today including controlling moisture content of wood, termite barriers and details, naturally durable and preservative treated wood, and quality assurance. And that's a free view um, publication on our website as well. It also talks a little bit about best practices in construction, including positive drainage, um, adequate separation of wood elements from uh, moisture sources uh, like uh, water, bulk water, or uh, soil and concrete. Uh, we talk about ventilation and condensation control, uh, and again, naturally durable and preservative treated wood. So as we get into this discussion, it's uh, important to know where is that line where um, the moisture content of the wood is conducive uh, for decay. And for the most part, moisture content less than 20%, you're not going to see decay. And so the optimum conditions for decay are above 25% moisture content. Um, between 20 and 25, you know, it's kind of a toss up depending on some other conditions that might be present uh, in, the, in the site. But again, those the optimum conditions are going to be at 25% or greater. I show this figure on the right from the Washington State uh, website um, because 
we will talk about this later on in the program, but if you would look at uh, if you're looking at this figure and think of the think of wood at the cellular level as a bundle of straws, and we've we've talked before on some of our webinars about wood uh, and and its makeup. But if if you think about these long tubes as straws, drinking straws, coffee stirs, whatever analogy works best in your mind. Um, it is important to note that water uh, moves very easily through these, uh, through the end of the straws, if we want to continue that analogy. And so the end grain of wood, which is represented here with um, this, uh, this sort of matrix look here at the top, is where water not only more quickly leaves the wood product, uh, or, but also where it can draw moisture more easily. So one of the principles that we'll reinforce as we talk today is protecting the end grain of wood, especially in exposed conditions, uh, to prevent uh, moisture uh, content uh, from increasing to the levels where it can lead to decay. So. This gives us a sense of uh, different parts of the country uh, where you have a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, um, and liquid flow is the most significant moisture uh, load on, on a structure, on wood products, and that comes either from rain and, and gravity flow uh, of water or groundwater, which can be wicked up into wood products depending on their proximity to the, the groundwater. Um, so liquid flow is uh, a significant moisture load. Air movement and diffusion are other uh, ways that water can move uh, into buildings or around wood products and also can be uh, contributors but are less significant moisture contributors than the liquid flow and the, and the capillary action uh, of water. And so as we talk today about uh, durability, we're going to talk a lot about controlling liquid uh, moisture. Um, and, and this chart from the USDA Forest Products Lab Wood Handbook will help sort of reinforce that Point when we talk about relative humidity, and this, this chart represents um, the relationship between relative humidity temperature, which is over here on the left uh, side of the chart, and uh, moisture content or equilibrium moisture content. And you see the box all the way over to the, to the right um, is where we've got you know, moisture contents in that 20 to 25 percent range. And again, that's not even up to that optimum condition where we talked about earlier where decay is likely to occur, but you can see that, that you've got to have a, a very high relative humidity, and that's got to be for a pretty extended period of time to even get the higher moisture contents that could lead to decay. And so we um, talk about covered structures um, and protecting uh, ex even exposed wood products, but if they're under a covered roof, and we'll show examples of that, uh, those would be considered dry and less than 19% moisture content, which is another trigger in the design process for, for uh, the designers in the audience today. Not only are we dealing with uh, a, a trigger for um, mold and, and decay, but we have a, another um, limit here at 19% where we would need to apply adjustment factors for uh, adjusting strength and stiffness and connection capacities if it exceeds that 19% threshold. So. Um, you see the terms desorption and resorption. Those are, are the technical terms from the Wood Handbook that kind of give you a sense of, uh, of what's going on as wood products dry down. It's called desorption. And that happens much more 
quickly and is much uh, easier to accomplish than resorption or adsorption where uh, you're gaining moisture content in the wood. So again, as we talk about some of these concepts today, these principles are important to, to understand in that, uh, in that process. So I'm going to ask Marcy to come back, and we're going to throw a couple of these polls in along the way and see how we're doing. All righty. So what is the optimum moisture content for wood decay? Is that 10%, 15%, 20%, or 25%? Everybody's jumping in right away and voting. That's awesome. All right, we're almost to 80%. Just a few more people to vote. Okay, we are there. Great. All right. Let's see how many got it right. All right, so we have 80%, say 25%, 14%, say 20%. 4%, 15, and only 1%, 10. And, buddy, what is the correct answer? Okay, so the majority got it right. It is 25% is the optimum level for decay. A couple slides back if you've got the handouts. Um, in fact, I'll just jump there real quickly so you can uh, see that. Uh, we mentioned that at 25% or greater is the optimum condition for decay. So, again, that doesn't affect your um, CEU in any way, um, just to help in the learning process. So let's now jump uh, on to our next topic, which is some of the water management principles. Um, you may have seen this in various websites, because I saw it as I was doing some research for this particular presentation. Uh, a lot of times you may see this as the four D's of uh, water management. We've added a fifth uh, for our discussion here. Um, so deflection, uh, the one we've added is distance or separation, uh, and we'll talk about that with some of the details that we'll show. Drainage, drying, and durable materials. These are, the again, the four or five D's of water management that may, you know, that may help you to remember uh, some of these principles, and we'll talk about uh, these in the coming slides. So um, one of the first one has to do with um, drainage and keeping, uh, you know, managing bulk water. Uh, site drainage obviously is important, keeping water moving away from the structure. Uh, building drainage from the roof to the gutters and then away from the building is, is part of that principle. Separation of wood elements uh, away from moisture sources and condensation control are also important. Um, material handle and handling and storage is uh, sort of related to this as well because um, during the construction process, uh, especially for engineered wood products that are coming to the job site, those engineered wood products are typically manufactured at a moisture content less than 15%. And so as uh, you can imagine, if the products are handled in a manner like you're seeing here uh, on the screen where they're exposed, uh, where they can soak up moisture from the soil. We mentioned capillary action or if they're sitting in puddles or water uh, that's uh, sitting on a job site. They can really um, pick up a lot of moisture and, and the other thing that we I probably didn't talk about when we talked about um, the increase in moisture content is that that causes swelling of those uh, wood cells at that cellular cellular level, which creates expansion in the even in the joints of these products. So where the OSB in this eye joist, for example, connects to the to the um, flange, which is typically a, a structural composite lumber or something like that. And if you're increasing the moisture content of that product and um, 
creating swelling that can affect the, even the structural integrity of those products. Now, many of these products are designed to handle some typical, um, typical what we'll call, you know, weathering that can occur uh, during the construction phase. Uh, but our goal is to try and minimize exposure to moisture. And what you're seeing here on the screen is way beyond the normal uh, construction sequence that is anticipated for a wood product. So this looks like it's been sitting out as you know for months. Um, in exposed uh, conditions. And so most of these products are shipped to the job site with tarps and coverings to protect them. And the better the, the industry practice, like you're seeing here in this slide for material handling and storage, is to get it up off the ground and keep it covered. And so this is an excellent example of job site storage preparing for you know, the installation process, um, staging these materials prior to installation. So this is the kind of handling, material handling and storage that we want to see on the job site and that you can help uh, us to pass along to contractors and uh, folks who are involved in the building process. We also want to close in as quickly as possible and so getting the roof coverings and the building envelope on um, is important, but there are some additional precautions that can be taken, uh, especially if there are going to be any kind of construction delays uh, or if there just happens to be a long, you know, system of weather that's unanticipated where you just, you can't get on the job site or, or um, you want to make sure you're protecting uh, some of those products from picking up moisture and so um, close in uh, and taking some of these types of precautions are ways that you can accommodate that but if you do get moisture in, into the structure and, and this is probably not uncommon if you get a heavy rain uh, again the materials are manufactured to handle these short-term uh, weather conditions but you know getting this standing water moved off the floor, swept away, um, shop facts, whatever it takes to, you know, to get this out of there and then dried in or dried out before you're installing insulation and gypsum. Again, these are just good industry practices to, to deal with not only the durability issues that we're talking about today, but shrinkage and other issues as well that are important to the to the whole building process. So these are some tips that are important. So we'll start looking now at some of the code provisions that are uh, outlined. And, and here's one of those that deals with uh, glue lamb. And I want to get down here to my notes so I can, um, can I, I can read some of those code provisions. This is from the code section shown on your screen, 2304.12.2.4, this is the 2015 IBC, says portions of glued laminated timbers that form the structural supports of a building or other structure and are exposed to weather and not fully protected from moisture by a roof, eave, or similar covering shall be pressure treated with preservatives or manufactured from naturally durable or preservative treated would. So solutions for an exposed condition like this are to preservatively treat the wood, use naturally durable wood, or get it underneath a roof, eave, or similar uh, covering. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we show here, which are the uh, top and end caps that uh, is, again, good industry practice that you'll see in a lot of uh, applications. But I've shown this this uh, uh, picture again, this image from before at the cellular level, the bundle of straws or the end grain, um, because again, when you have this type of exposed end grain, that is where moisture is most likely to more quickly enter 
the wood product. It's going to come in through the, you know, by, by capillary action through the end grain of the wood product. And so protecting that end grain uh, is uh, really, really important unless, again, you are preservatively treating or providing a naturally durable species. Again, we're talking about untreated wood where we want to make sure that we're um, protecting uh, those, uh, those products. And so let's look at this next um, slide where we talk about uh, top caps and end caps. This is from an APA publication. I uh, believe it's um, T300 available from the APA website that shows uh, top caps and end caps that can be installed. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a second. But um, those, again, are um, just another industry practice that can be used to protect those uh, untreated wood products. The other um, method that was mentioned specifically in the code language was uh, tapered underneath of the uh, roof or eave. And in this case, an untreated uh, wood product is fine and uh, protected from the weather. Um, uh, some additional paint and maintenance is shown here. Uh, which is probably a good, again, a good practice. But this type of exposure um, is um, permitted. Um, and here you see a little bit of a mix of both practices where you've got the products uh, up here under the eave. You see the probably these are glued laminated timbers, but they've got the end caps. Even if they're underneath the, the eave or the roof, um, because they're not tapered, they're squared off, it's good practice to put those end caps there, again, to protect a very vulnerable area of the wood product, which is that end grain. So hopefully that gives you some good ideas about um, protection of those products. Um, not only is it important on the exterior of the um, building, to protect it from moisture, but interior as well, proper ventilation to move moisture out of attic systems, like you see here, the moisture uh, up underneath the, the uh, roof system uh, came probably from improper ventilation, and then venting bathrooms and things like that into the, the attic space. So. Those, again, are, are just detailing um, tips that can help. Some additional uh, code requirements then come from, uh, and we're going to be looking at both the IRC and the IBC for some of these requirements, uh, both 2015 versions of those codes. And the IRC R13 or R317.1. And then IBC 2304.12.1.1 talk about distance uh, between the, the girder and floor joist over a crawl space. So this is the distance to uh, soil or exposed earth in this case, 12 inches minimum for the girders, 18 inches minimum for the floor joist. Uh, moving to next section of the code, um, in those area, in those sections, uh, talks about the the minimums at the exterior for uh, the you, if you have wood siding or treated wood, um, then on top of say a concrete or masonry. Um, uh, wall uh, system. So I'm looking here. It's, uh, sorry, some of my notes. Uh, we also talk about um, brick veneer, flashing materials, weep holes behind the, the brick veneer. Again, some good construction details uh, to make sure that water is moving away from those um, wood products and um, avoiding decay issues. 
Um, let's get then to our next slide. Siding clearances, if you have wood siding. Um, we're going to have that 6-inch minimum then to from wood siding to the earth, 8 inches to the treated wood on top of uh, the, the um, or to the uh, plywood and other untreated wood uh, products there. Um, you're gonna, it's going to require treated wood in contact with concrete or masonry here at this sill plate um, location. But again, that's all spelled out in, in the code details. If you've got a concrete porch or a patio slab, you need that minimum two-inch clearance to wood siding. Again, we're showing some of the details on the interior as well in this particular detail. Uh, but then uh, similar two-inch minimum clearance on a, a roof system up to uh, wood siding. Um, and then again, showing flashing um, and uh, sheathing paper to where required to um, prevent uh, exposure to the untreated products behind the, the siding uh, products. Wood columns then are covered in uh, these code sections and would uh, require a moisture barrier and a, and a one inch separation between uh, the concrete um, in this particular um, detail, um, if we're over exposed uh, wood, uh, exposed earth uh, in a crawl space type situation like we showed earlier, then that eight inch minimum uh, kicks in to um, untreated wood. So those are uh, code required minimums and that's one of the D's that we talk about is distance that comes right out of the code and is required to, again, maintain uh, separation and keep moisture from getting into the, the untreated wood products. So let's uh, bring Marcy back. We've got another poll question for you to participate in and take a okay. look. Okay. All right. So let's see here. Which is not a solution for protecting exposed structural glue land? Is that preservative treated or naturally durable wood, taper under a roof or eave, incising, top and end caps? Which of those is the answer? Alrighty. Just a few more. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and go ahead and share it. So 89% say incising, 6% taper and roof, excuse me, taper under the roof and eave, 3% um, preservative treated or naturally durable wood, and 3% top and end caps. And so that's um, 89 incising. So, all right. Great. great. Good, good to see the majority again got the correct answer. The correct answer is incising, uh, answer C. And we talked a little bit earlier about uh, glue lamb uh, and the code requirements for preservative treated or naturally durable, tapered under the roof or eave, industry practice for top and end caps. Now incising is a uh, method that can be used uh, for primarily though for um, lumber or timber to get the preservatives to penetrate. It's much less common I believe in glue lamb, although if, if we have some glue lamb manufacturers on they can they can correct me and Michelle can can um, chime in at the Q&A if I got that wrong, but I don't know that they use a lot of uh, incising for glue lamb to get those preservatives to uh, to penetrate, but, in, but it, uh, incising needs something else uh, to accomplish the, the durability aspect. So let's then move on to our next uh, topic, which is termite damage, and you uh, hopefully haven't seen too many uh, examples like this of termite damage, but uh, this is uh, what 
they can do, and it's uh, pretty devastating. Um, if something like that, if they if they get into uh, a wood structure, so there are several different methods for uh, termite control. Uh, again, we've talked about this already. Preservative treated wood is is a bio, it's, it's introducing a biocide into the wood product that will kill the uh, termites or will just make it you know so that they don't even want to want to partake. And so um, the other uh, options include shields, and we'll show some examples of that. Chemical treatments in the soil around the structure to uh, kill or prevent them from uh, getting to the structure, concrete foundations and concrete caps, and then inspection also is, you know, something we talk about quality assurance and maintenance, um, uh, something that is uh, important as well to, to nip it in the bud before it actually becomes a problem. So I'm not an entomologist, but I play one on TV, and here's an example of uh, the difference between a termite shown on the right of your screen and a flying ant. So not all flying ants are termites. You notice with the flying ant the thin waist there, um, the forewings longer than the hind wings, the elbowed antennas uh, compared to the straight antennas for the termite, the thick waist and then the equal wing size. So if you are doing any kind of inspection or you just, you know, your own personal um, uh, exposure to, to these insects, uh, this may help you distinguish between one that can do a lot of damage and one that's probably just a little more of a, a pest. But the termite shields, and again, these graphics are taken from the, the uh, WCD6 document that we developed, I showed you earlier. Uh, you can see here in the top left the pipe coming up through the structure, and so a, a termite um, shield there, um, a cap or a metal uh, flange that's soldered onto the pipe, keep them from getting up into the system. Uh, just the clearance itself, that 12-inch minimum clearance, and then some shields here um, over top of the concrete cap um, are other ways that you can uh, accomplish that. So we'll talk then about preservative treatments and a little bit more about uh, protecting the wood product um, by poisoning uh, either the termites or the mold and fungus that can occur. And you see termite damage there on the left, preservative treated wood in a deck uh, there on the right. The, the preservative treatment, uh, the effectiveness of the, the preservative treatment is, is really based on several things, several variables. One is the chemical type, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we go uh, along here in the presentation. The penetration of the preservative is important. We talked about incising as a way to get those chemicals to penetrate deeper into the product. Retention rates, that's the the amount of chemical that's injected into the wood product. And then uh, uniform distribution is important as well. Here's an example of the the issue of penetration. And you can see um, differences between um, species of wood, for example. We'll talk a little bit about refractory species. But you also get a sense of what happens at um, a cut end of a wood product. And that's important as well to note that if you do cut uh, a wood product that's been preservatively treated, then you're probably going to want to, not probably, you're definitely going to want to come back with a uh, topically applied um, preservative to protect this exposed wood. So typically good practice is if you're going to cut a, a post, for example, for a deck that goes into the ground, 
uh, cut the end that's going to be uh, up underneath the deck and not the end that's going to go down into the ground. So it's much easier to to do a topical coating on the end that's that's exposed up you know above the ground than it is um, well I guess you could you could you could coat it before you bury it too but um, just again good practice to get a coating of, of some sort on the ends if they are cut. Let's talk a little bit about refractory species. That's just a fancy word for species that are hard to treat. And you can see on the left here, uh, some of those refractory species, they don't absorb the chemical treatment as readily as the ones on the right here. ones on the right is probably a southern pine or a red pine um, that absorbs the treatment uh, a lot more readily. And so uh, the practice that uh, we've mentioned for getting those refractory species to absorb the preservatives is incising. And there is a design value adjustment for incising. It's at, right in the NDS. It's an adjustment to strength and stiffness properties because the incising involves cutting uh, the wood fibers at the surface with these small razor uh, sharp blades to allow a path for the preservative to penetrate, three quarters or an inch or whatever the AWPA standard calls for. So I want to distinguish between the adjustment that's used for incising versus um, the, the question we often get, is there an adjustment for the preservative alone? And the typical uh, waterborne preservatives um, that uh, are used on wood products uh, do not require uh, any additional adjustments. Now there there may be proprietary preservatives out there that have a code evaluation report of some sort uh, and if they affect the strength or stiffness properties at all they'd have to specify that in their code evaluation report. So fire retardant treatments, for example, different from what we're talking about here, but fire retardant treatments are an example of a um, of a treatment that would or have a strength or a stiffness adjustment. But for the typical preservative treatments, those uh, typically do not uh, require any adjustment to design properties. So. Make sure you're aware of that. AWPA stands for American Wood Protection Association. They develop a book of standards and have a what's called a use category system. UC stands for use category. And 3B is uh, one of the use categories for above ground exposed elements, deck boards, rails, siding, joists, that type of thing. UC4A is for ground contact. and general exposure, um, wood products exposed to soil, concrete, fresh water, things like deck posts, uh, some special heavy duty above ground applications like beams or girders uh, could be a, a ground contact general. UC4B, however, is uh, for heavy ground contact, uh, and that would be for structural members that are difficult or expensive to replace, and things like piles uh, underneath of a, of a wood structure um, are examples of where they, you know, or uh, marine uh, piles, things like that, that would be much more difficult to replace. Here's a a uh, table from uh, Western Wood Preservers Institute document shows those use categories over here on the right hand column and then shows some of the retention levels that we talked about. These are some of the typical retention levels in the treating standards for uh, some of the preservative treatments. The examples include ACQ or ACZA um, CA-C, a lot of those, the C stands for copper. Um, the DOTs are for the borates, um, and in a lot of cases aren't 
uh, allowed for applications except uh, above ground and protected from liquid water. So the, the borates, uh, D, uh, and you see that DOT typically uh, is for those borates, would be for things like sill plates uh, underneath a wall that uh, you still want to protect because they're exposed to concrete but are uh, pretty much protected from liquid water. The other types of preservatives include the oil-borne or oil-type preservatives. That would be your creosotes and pentachlorophenol um, preservatives. Waterborne, we talked about those, the CCA, this, the copper-based uh, preservatives. Um, you may recall CCA uh, has arsenic in it that was voluntarily removed from the market for uh, deck products quite a quite a few years back, and so newer products like the the copper azoles, the ACQs, ACZAs are now um, pretty predominant out there. And then we've got non-pressure preservatives like the water. Uh, repellent paint on type preservatives that we'll talk about here in a second. So the creosotes used a lot in marine applications and we'll just show a couple of slides here of different applications for some of these products. Uh, can be used in timber bridge applications like the one shown here. Uh, this horse stable uses pentachlorophenol um, and this timber bridge Again, depending on the the uh, application, the the um, geographic location, local conditions uh, may dictate what's more effective. And you want to talk to the manufacturers about your options and and where those are most effective. But this penta is used in a timber bridge application. Utility poles. Uh, a lot of times we'll use pentas. Uh, sound barriers. Uh, another good application for pentas, railroad trestles. Then the waterborns uh, will will come into play uh, more for um, areas where you've got a lot more human contact. This is a permanent wood foundation that uses a permanent that uses a a um, in this case I think CCA is still allowed for uh, permanent wood foundations. Uh, decks obviously use these waterborne preservatives as well. But then the thing you have to be aware of when we're using those types of preservatives in wood products is that there is more of a tendency there uh, for uh, corrosion of fasteners. And so then we get into the code sections, IRC R317.3 and 2304.10.5 that talk about protecting fasteners um, in, in, uh, from corrosion um, due to some of these chemical treatments. Screws, bolts, and nails are, are, uh, need, to, need to be hot dip, uh, per, uh, hot dip galvanized stainless silicon bronze or copper protection. Uh, hangers and anchors, it talks about galvanized and stainless. Um, there's an exception in there for those borates that we talked about earlier. Um, didn't have room for that on the slide, but there is that exception for borates that you'll want to look up. Then for saltwater exposure, that's not actually specified in the code, but let me get to a FEMA document here that I've got in my notes. FEMA TB. 8-96 Technical Bulletin 8. So FEMA Technical Bulletin 8, Corrosion Protection of Metal Connectors in Coastal Areas. Um, and that recommends stainless steel fasteners for uh, areas, areas exposed to uh, salt water. And some jurisdictions will actually specify a distance from uh, the shoreline for that. I think um, going from memory here, so look this up, don't just take my word for it. I think 300 feet is often used and in our deck document we may actually have some commentary on that that we can uh, verify during the, the Q&A section. But um, those are some additional uh, 
detailing and local jurisdiction requirements that you want to take a look at as well. The quality marks that show up on these preservative uh, treated products are important because it tells you that you've uh, got um, something that's being that's been certified that's got quality assurance per the the uh, um, the um, agency the American Wood Preservers Association and um, for lumber, treated lumber, American Lumber Standard Committee that sort of um, accredit and approve these organizations. Um, so the preservative use, the retention level, the company, um, the, the proper exposure condition, all of these show up on those stamps. And a lot of times those are stapled to the end of the product. And so you'll see those um, down at the end, stapled to the end of the product, showing up on just about every one of the, the treated wood uh, products. Then we'll talk a little bit about naturally durable wood. Uh, the code has specific language for decay resistant uh, materials like redwood, cedars, black locusts, and then termite resistant um, species like redwoods and eastern cedars and those then are used in you know sensitive applications this is an example of a reservoir cover a drinking water reservoir in Los Angeles um, used Alaskan yellow cedar glue lamb and trusses for all the structural wood products so they wouldn't have to worry about any preservatives in the in the wood products and so those are obviously um, then suitable for structural applications as well. Redwood, um, I, especially for you folks out west, used a lot in outdoor exposed applications. Then we get to the non-pressure preservatives. These are the water repellent preservatives that can be painted on. Um, the oil-borne uh, preservatives, if, if they are to be topically applied, uh, tip, are typically not recommended for the painting uh, process, so dipping or a vacuum process is a way that those can be applied. Uh, if it's, and, and these are for um, moderate exposures, like for window siding, exterior trim, porch framing, those types of things. So... The Wood Handbook um, that we've referenced before has a pretty interesting table here. Table 16-5 talks about initial application and maintenance of exterior wood finishes with these water repellent preservatives, uh, stains, and paints, and these solid color uh, stains. Um, I was joking with somebody on staff when I looked at this table and saw the 10 to 20 year um, service light for paint, um, I'm really interested in finding one of those. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess they're out there. Um, safety data sheets available from EPA and the manufacturers anytime we're talking about the types of preservatives that um, are used to you know, prevent uh, mold and termites uh, and other uh, wood destroying organisms could potentially have uh, some effect on human health and so these symbols uh, on those safety data sheets have different meanings for folks for example this one in the middle has to do with uh, folks with respiratory conditions and so take a look at the safety data sheets as well uh, and I'm going to ask Marcy to come back and f take us through our final poll question here as we're about to wrap up. Okay, and buddy, this is Suzanne. I'm actually going to step in and take that one for Marcy. Great. And here is our last poll question, which is, which is important for effective uh, preservative treatment? So you can select chemical type, penetration, retention, uniform distribution, or all of the above. And everybody's quickly getting on that. I'll give a few more seconds before I close it. Okay. And
and here are our results. Great. So looks like everybody nailed that one. Probably that means that's, that question was too easy. So we'll have to do a little bit better job of coming up with some more difficult questions next time. But uh, yeah, all of those issues, let me bring that back here on the screen that we talked about chemical type, penetration, retention, uniform distribution, all important for preservative treatments. All right, we'll talk then just briefly about quality assurance. Um, and this really has to do with the inspection process, which is already in place. Uh, you code officials who are here today um, obviously have a lot of responsibility in this, this area to make sure that um, structures are, are being built to, to code and, and uh, many of those code requirements have to do with um, the, the weatherproofing and, and exterior parts of the building which are really important. We talk about special inspections. Uh, we're talking about high wind and high seismic areas primarily but that is also important to make sure that there is structural integrity. So if we're talking about durability for these structures, uh, that uh, often has more to do, um, is more involved than just protecting it from the, the, the weather uh, elements that can cause mold and decay. It's protecting uh, against hurricanes and, and earthquakes that could create um, um, problems with the, you know, with the exterior of the structure and, and create a breach. So those details, if, um, if inspected properly, can, can go a long way toward protecting the structure long term. Uh, conformance to standards, the, the, we talked about the quality marks and making sure that you have products that are uh, approved uh, with or, or have those quality marks that show they go through the rigorous quality process through the standards development process or evaluation reports for some of those uh, proprietary uh, products. We'll finish up here um, talking about the uh, resources available. We mentioned this one. Uh, at the beginning of the program, design, WCD6, Design of Wood stru Frame Structures for Permanence, talks about good construction practices, drainage, separation, dealing with condensation and barriers, durability uh, issues like natural, naturally durable materials, pressure treatment, and non-pressure treated. Um, we have another document uh, available uh, on our website for wood deck construction. Of course, decks are, for the most part, exposed, and so there's a lot of good industry practice um, for wood products used in deck applications and fasteners exposed to the elements, and so we deal extensively with those issues in the wood deck construction guide as well. The USDA Forest Products Lab Wood Handbook, if you just Google that, title there on the screen. It'll get you to a free document. It has a lot of great uh, resources. Um, chapter 13 deals with drying and control of moisture uh, and dimensional change for wood products. Chapter 14, biodeterioration of wood. Chapter 15, wood preservation. Uh, again, a, a very, very helpful uh, and, and good resource. They've also done a series of videos on the FPL website, a moisture management series um, for foundations, walls, roofs. So that's a good source. Our uh, sister association in Canada, the Canadian Wood Council, also has some good resources. You may recognize some of these photos that I borrowed from them for the slides and so this is good information as well from our friends north of the border but obviously these have application all across North America. Uh, another sister association Re Rethink Wood and you see the web address there. You saw some of the uh, photos uh, from a CEU that they've developed uh, for uh, uh, designed for durability 
and you can also pick up additional CEU credits on their website. Many of what's uh, the uh, thumbnails shown here on this um, slide uh, include CEUs uh, from Rethink Wood. Uh, our sister association, Woodworks, does uh, provides a lot of good information as well, and also project support that Marcy will share with you here in a second. But um, that's another resource. And our sister association, APA, has uh, resources as well. Build a better home, um, construction details for moisture-resistant homes. So you see a lot of the common elements here are protecting wood from moisture, and that's really the key. And so I'm going to stop there because we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to ask Marcy to come and close us out, and then we're going to come back after that for some Q&A. Okay. Give me just one second here. Um, did I? Yes, I am on. Sorry. <laughs> um, let me... Okay. Sorry about that. Are you seeing my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, Buddy said um, about our sister um, corporation here, or the net corporation, but pro let me just start over. <laughs> Sorry. Our sister um, organization, Woodworks, um, they um, provide wood project assistance and other resources. Reach out to them at help at woodworks.org or visit their website. And then um, we have a design professional me membership that helps you to stay informed about technical issues affecting the wood industry. Um, there's lots of benefits, including discounts on our publications. Go to www.awc.org membership if you're interested. And then we also have a code connections, um, code official connections program um, for qualifying code officials. As you can see it on the slide, there are many benefits associated with that program. Um, if you're qual a qualified code official, we encourage you to sign up at awc.org slash code connections. Um, and then all these reminders about what we what I stated at the beginning, give us about a half an hour to run reports and then keep an eye out for our email. Um, complete the survey for another chance to win a free publication. Check for information about your certificate of completion and CEUs. Note that the actual certificate won't be immediately available. They'll be available within two weeks of today. Remember that in order to receive your credit, you must have been present for 90% of the one-hour webinar, which is 54 minutes. And then join us again in September and October for our Calculating Loads webinars and tell your friends to join us. And then also available is our e-learning or self-directed study program, which you can find in the education section of our web web page and if you want to book a live presentation just contact us and if you have any other questions or want information just email us at education at awc.org or visit us at www.awc.org and I think that's all my information so thanks once again for your attention and now back to Betty and Michelle for some Q&A. Great thanks Marcy and mm -hmm. Michelle what questions do we have? Yeah, we have a lot of questions, and unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get back to all of them, but we will be providing um, an FAQ after the webinar, correct? Is yes, that, uh, that's correct. Fine? Yeah. So the first question has to do with where does the code define naturally durable wood? Great. And um, where do does one get design values for those? Okay, good good question. Thanks for that. The um, chapter two of the IBC actually uh, defines naturally durable wood. It talks about the heartwood of the following species, uh, and then lists the ones that I shared uh, earlier on uh, on a slide. And so it it gets. Um, fairly specific um, and oh it actually includes one that I, I maybe missed on the slide I have to go back and, and uh, update that black walnut is included as <laughs> a naturally decay resistant species and then um, it's pretty specific about for termite resistance with the 
redwood, Alaskan yellow cedar, eastern red cedar, and western red cedar. So take a look at chapter two of the IBC. Design values for those come from the NDS supplement. So use the NDS supplement the way you would for any other uh, wood product and pull, pull your design values from there. Great. Okay, one more question came in regarding the reference to the FEMA document um, related to stainless steel fasteners. Um, okay. They just wanted to get clarification on that. Yeah, so that's a FEMA technical bulletin. And so what I'm going to do here and see if I can make this happen, I'm going to actually go to the document on our website, which is our uh, DCA6, Prescriptive Residential Wood Deck Construction Guide. And you saw me navigating to that. So if you want to search for that document, um, yourself. I'm going to scroll down here to the commentary because I think uh, down here in the commentary is where we talk a little bit about that and we'll see if I can get kind of chapter and verse. Um, so under number seven here, let me make that a little bit bigger for folks to be, be able to see that. Um, we talk about um, FEMA Technical Bulletin 8 dash 96, corrosion protection of metal connectors in coastal areas. Recommend stainless steel fasteners be used in areas exposed to salt water. I thought maybe we had something in here about distance to shoreline, but we may have removed that just because it varies so much from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So check with your local code officials, see if they have anything more specific about distance to shoreline for that. Great. Um, one more question regarding, can you talk a little bit about glue laminated timbers um, between Douglas fir and southern pine and incising factor and how that all relates in the absorption of preservative treatment? Yeah, so I was kind of hoping one of my our glue lamp manufacturers would bail us out here. I'm, I'm going to probably have to... Um, beg off on that whole question of incising um, glue lamb because uh, I've, I've heard different things. I'm pretty confident southern pine glue lamb does not have to be incised for the same reasons that southern pine uh, lumber does not have to be incised because it soaks up the preservative so readily. Now for Doug fir, um, I know for Doug fir lumber and timbers incising is generally used. You folks out on the West Coast see that all the time in the piers and decks. Um, I don't know, and so I'm going to recommend you talk to Western manufacturers about incising, unless, Michelle, you were able to find the answer. Well, the table 5.3.1 in the NDS does not have an incising factor. That's okay. the applicable adjustment factors for structural laminated timbers. Yeah, but as I recall, that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't incise them. It just means that because right. glue lambs are so big, there's really no strength reduction right. by incising them. And so that's exactly. really the issue. It may be incised, and, and maybe that's really the answer uh, for designers out there. Is you, you, even if it is incised, if it, the glue lamb is incised, you're not going to have a strength reduction for it. So if it is required to get the preservative treatment, that's fine, but you don't have to take a reduction. So that maybe that's a, I can bail myself out of the not knowing by <laughs> giving that answer. Okay, you have time for one more question? Sure thing. Where does the code have provisions for building envelopes? Oh, great question. And one of our um, code official experts sent me some of this right before the uh, webinar. So I'm going to ask Brian, because I think I sent him some of these links. So we didn't get this included. Um, we probably, you know, if we decide to expand this to a maybe a two-hour uh, web, webinar or seminar at some point, we might add these. But what Brian just shared with you is from the International Building Code up in the administrative section. 107.2.4 deals with exterior wall envelope. And then 1403 and 1405 of the IBC, you can see some additional um, code provisions that deal with that exterior envelope. So um, those are really good um, resources to, to take a look at, study, 
and um, probably something we'll be adding to this program for future future seminars and webinars. So I think that's probably about all the time we have for questions, Michelle. So thank you all yep. for being here today, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next month.